So I know this is uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, so I, I, I preface that to say I know what day it is. And so as we look at our series in Exodus, we are, we are finishing this book up. And we're going to cover a larger passage of scripture than normal. So if you have your Bibles, favorite electronic devices, Exodus 35 is where we're going to be at today. Exodus chapter 35 uh, through a little bit of 36. And the reason why I'm dealing with this passage in a big chunk is that scripture was not written in just like fortune cookie lines. If it was, that's how I would preach it. I would preach it like a fortune cookie. But it's not a fortune cookie. And so we believe that not only are the words of Scripture inspired, but the form is inspired as well. So that means instead of just kind of focusing on maybe one word, we have many words put together. And Exodus 35 through the first part of 36 tells one kind of complete thought or idea. So a general rule of thumb, however, when you're dealing with preachers, is the, the, the guys who have more Scripture usually preach shorter time. It's always that preacher that you got to be careful of who has like, I'm just going to use one word today. It means you're going to be here forever. Okay. So more scripture does not mean necessarily mean longer sermons. So, but I wanted us to cover this whole passage this morning, Exodus 35. Once again, we have just seen God, Moses has been up the mountain twice already. Uh, the law has been given. And Exodus 35 is, begins to march us from here to essentially the promised land, although there's some frustrations in the way. And the theme is, is that the gift is in your midst. The gift is in your midst. So Exodus 35, it says, Moses assembled the entire Israelite community and he said to them, these are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. For six days work is to be done, but on the seventh day you are to have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord, and anyone who does work on it must be executed. So do not light a fire in any of your homes on the Sabbath day. Verse 4. Then Moses said to the entire Israelite community, This is what the Lord has commanded. Take up an offering among you for the Lord. Let everyone whose heart is willing, if you highlight your Bible or you uh, mark in it, that, that's important. Let everyone whose heart is willing bring this as the Lord's offering. Bring gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, yarn fine linen and goat hair, ram skins dyed red and fine leather, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx with gemstones to mount on the ephod and breastpiece. That's the, that's the clothing that the priest was going to wear. Let all the skilled artisans among you come and make everything that the Lord has commanded. And that includes the tabernacle, its tin and covering, its clasp and its supports and its crossbars, its pillar and bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat, and the curtain for the screen, the table with its poles and all its utensils and the bread of the presence, the lampstand for light with its utensils and lamps as well as the oil for the light, the altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, the entryway screen for the entrance to the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offerings with its bronze grate, its poles and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, the hangings of the courtyard, its posts and bases, and the screens for the gate of the courtyard, the, the ten pegs for the tabernacle and the ten pegs for the courtyard along with the ropes and the specially woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary, the holy garments for the priest and Aaron and the garments for his sons to serve as priests. Hit pause real quick. If, if all that just seems like, what? We had a great speaker back in March, um, Rock and Visual Ministries, it's on YouTube. Uh, he can in one hour cover what would have taken me probably like ten years to cover and he did a better job. So if, if you want to refresh yourselves on how all those elements point us towards Jesus, Back in March, there was a sermon that's recorded. You can watch and, and catch up on that. All right, verse 20. And I had this one highlighted. Then the entire Israelite community left Moses' presence, and everyone whose heart was moved and whose spirit prompted him came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of the meeting, for all of its services, and for the holy garments. Both men and women came, all who had willing hearts, brought brooches, Earrings, rings, and necklaces, and all kinds of gold jewelry. Everyone who presented a presentation offering of gold to the Lord. Everyone who possessed blue or purple or scarlet yarn, fine linen or goat hair, ram skins dyed red or fine leather brought them. Everyone making an offering of silver, red, or fine leather brought them. Everyone making an offering of silver or bronze, excuse me, brought it as a contribution to the Lord. Everyone who possessed acacia wood, useful for any task in the work, they brought it. 
Every skilled woman spun yarn with her hands and brought it, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen. And all the women whose hearts were moved spun the goat hair by virtue of their skill. The leaders brought onyx and gemstones to mount on the ephod and breastpiece, as well as the spice and oil for the light, for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. And so the Israelites brought a freewill offering to the Lord, all the men and women whose hearts prompted them to bring something for all the work that the Lord, through Moses, had commanded to be done. And then Moses then said to the Israelites, Look, the Lord is appointed by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. He has filled him with God's spirit, with wisdom, understanding, and ability in every kind of craft, to design artistic works in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut gemstones for mounting, and to carve wood for work in every kind of artistic craft. He has also given both him and Oliab, son of Ahasamach, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with the skill to do all the work of a gem cutter, a designer, an embroiderer in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, and a weaver. They can do every kind of craft and design artistic designs. So Bezalel, Eliab, and all the skilled people are to work based on everything the Lord has commanded. The Lord has given them wisdom and understanding to know how to do all the work of constructing the sanctuary. And so Moses summoned Bezalel, Eliab, and every skilled person in whose heart the Lord had placed wisdom, all whose hearts moved them to come to the work and do it. They took from Moses' presence all the contributions that the Israelites had brought for the task of making the sanctuary. And meanwhile, the people continued to bring freewill offerings morning after morning. Then all the artisans who were doing all the work for the sanctuary, they came one by one from the work they were doing, and they said to Moses, The people are bringing more than is needed for the construction of the work the Lord commanded to be done. So after Moses gave an order, they sent the proclamation throughout the camp, saying, Let no man or woman make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people stopped, for the materials were sufficient for them to do all the work. There was more than enough. I know that's a lot of scripture, but one of my fears is, is if I don't read it aloud, you will never read it on your own. And if you don't read it on your own, you miss some of the, like the four principles we're going to talk about today of how God provides for his work and he uses everyone to do it. So that, that's where we're going. So let's introduce the text just super quick this morning. So the Lord has spoken. He's given a word to Moses. And when God gives you a word, you have to determine, is it a now word or is it a later word? Some of us, if you're geared like I am or not to name names, Bob Green, when we get an idea, we just want to make it happen. Right, Bob? Yes, sir. You, you can deny it, but we know you. When Bob and I get an idea, and we're ready to go. Let's make it happen. That's just this, this word. It's a word from God. It's got to be now. It's got to be now. The funny thing is, is though, Josh also will get these ideas where he's like, I want to do it now, and it comes to me. And then in those moments, I'm like, that's a good word. You've got to wait. It's like, oh, I don't want to wait. I don't want to embrace the process. Here's the thing. The Lord speaks. And when he speaks, we have to determine, is this word for now or is it for later? Moses knew that this was a word, this commandment was for now, and it needed immediate attention. Now, interestingly, Numbers chapter 9 tells us that it was a year, a year before Israel leaves this place from this point going forward. It takes them a year to build this tabernacle and to do all these things. A year in the process. A year in the waiting. But they had to start now to get it done. One of the harder parts of following Jesus is knowing when a word is for now and when a word is for later. Anybody experiencing that? Like the Lord's speaking, but you have to discern, oh Lord, is this, is this for me now? Or is this for later? Generally speaking, if you are a now person, the Lord gives you later words. If you're a procrastinator, he will give you now words. He will give you words that challenge you, that cause you to have to wait upon him and to lean not on your own understanding. But we have to be obedient. And I think the people in this room, I know you well enough that we want to be obedient to what God is speaking and what God is asking. So often, though, in our desire to be obedient, we may get the, the action right, but we get the timing wrong. How many of you realize that timing is important? Okay, timing is very important. 
For example, a couple weeks ago, I am preaching a message, and I somehow forget that my wife wore a veil at our wedding. <laughs> you see, if I had forgot and I was 96 years old, everybody in the room would have been like, oh, pastor, that was so long ago. But because I'm 36, everybody's like, I can't believe you forgot. Of all the things that this group of people will remember about me someday when I die, my lack of, my distaste for mustard and the fact that I didn't know my wife wore a veil. Okay, so I forgot. It happens. But my timing was wrong. So often in life, just in, in our Christian discipleship, we get the actions right, but we get our timing wrong. We step out in front of God or we step behind God, and either way, we miss God. Now Moses knew what he had was a word from God, and he knew that it was time to build what God had told him to build. So Moses does what good communicators and good leaders do. Moses communicates the importance of this word to the people. Because here's the reality. If Moses had shared this or he had kept this word to himself, the people would not have been able to build the tabernacle. Good leaders communicate what God is saying, and they show where God is leading. Part of my job as a pastor, and I do not do this well all the time, is I'm not only supposed to communicate what God is saying, but I need to make sure I'm communicating where God is leading. Where is God taking us as a church? Where is God taking us as a community? Where is God taking us as a spiritual region? Where are we going as a body of believers? It's part of my job is to communicate it so that we might be obedient to what God is saying in this time. I also want to just take a moment. If you are uh, in charge of a family, if you have family, if you have kids, kids at home, adult kids, whatever the case might be, you have a responsibility to communicate where you're going as a family. Lead them. Communicate with your kids. But make sure you're communicating spiritually where you're going as a family so that you can hold them accountable and your kids can hold you accountable you got to lead, and to, to lead well, you have to communicate. So as we look at this, we, we see throughout Exodus and, and Numbers and Leviticus and different places, the tabernacle, the place where God was worshipped, and its furnishings, it was pretty complex and pretty intricate. Because what was being built was being for God. And everything about the tabernacle pointed people towards Jesus or towards God. In fact, the book of Hebrews, and I don't have time to preach it today, says that the earthly tabernacle was uh, represented, was a duplicate or a, a replica of a tabernacle that was in heaven made by God. Interesting, read, read Hebrews later. The tabernacle points people to God and therefore to Jesus. And so I always cringe when believers say things like this, well, God doesn't care how we worship. Mm. culturally that may be correct biblically that's wrong and I'm not talking about suits and ties I'm comfortable in a suit and tie I need to, I need to do something that makes me look a little bit older right so that's why I wear a suit and tie tired of mother-in-laws being like you can't be the preacher marrying my daughter and stuff I'm like you want to see my license that happened like last weekend again had to prove I'm like I am old enough so I showed her my credential card she says I want to see your driver's license she's my friend now that, that was Nikki's mom, congratulations on getting married last weekend, by the way. Yeah. I'm not talking about our clothes. I'm not talking about whether you play on a grand piano, because do you realize that up until the days of uh, just a couple hundred years ago, the piano was not played in church, it was only played in bars and saloons? It wasn't until the early 1800s that a piano was actually used in church. Yeah. I'm thankful it's used in church. I don't go to bars, so I might as well play one at church, right? So I'm not talking about the music. I'm not talking whether you're, you're playing a Fender guitar or a PRS guitar or a Gibson. I'm not talking about electric drums or acoustic drums. That's not what we're talking about. But how we worship God does matter. The position of our hearts matters. How we approach the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords does matter. And if you don't believe me, just look at Scripture and look how much time God took to communicate to his people that, hey, how you worship me matters. And as Israel would take the tabernacle with them, and as they were in this very secular environment, they are taking the holy with them. 
And as they're taking the holy with them, it was Israel's job to be the priests and to show the world what it meant to worship a real, true God. Therefore, how they worshipped mattered. The ministry done before the Lord matters, and it should be given the best of our time and our attention and our energy. We don't always get everything right here. We strive for excellence. I make mistakes on the piano. But what you may not realize is how many hours goes in to make sure that this 90 minutes on a Sunday morning is the very best we can do. We have multiple crews who clean the church multiple times a week. We practice Thursday nights. We practice early Sunday mornings. When the worship set is put together, we send it and no one knows, but Jenny Keene puts it all together and makes sure that everything's working and ready to go for this week and each week. And it doesn't mean, she may not even be in Missouri. She may be traveling on the road and from hotel rooms. She's making get all this stuff going on. We strive very hard because we believe that the worship of Jesus matters. Like it's the most important thing we do all week long. And I know some of us are picky about our cars and whether they look good or, or whether they have a spot on it. And if, if the way we drive our cars and the way it represents us matters, how much more does our worship of Jesus matter? So worship matters. Therefore, I have what we call a high view of church. I'm going to introduce you to a big word I spent a lot of money to learn. So here's your word for the day. Ecclesiology. Someone say ecclesiology. Okay. Ology means study of. Ecclesia is the word where we get the word church. It means the assembly or the gathering. And so when you take ecclesia and you put it with ology, you have the study of the church. So I have what they call a high ecclesiology, meaning that I, I look at the church and I don't say, eh. I look at the church and I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much for this thing you've given us. Therefore, I take the church very seriously. And as we see in passages like this, it's not just a matter of me having a moment with Jesus on Sunday or somewhere reading my Bible. I'm really concerned about people who are all the time saying, well, you know, I don't need to go to church. You don't? Because I sure do. Oh, I don't need other believers. I just, yeah, I just need me and Jesus. Um, I struggle with that. For many reasons, and one of them from our passage today, so point number one, is going to be that we see that Moses didn't build the tabernacle by himself, but all the congregation and all the people had something, some part to play in it. You see, Jesus said that where two or three are gathered together, I'm in the midst of them. So we might say it like this, I am not the church, but we are the church with each one of us having a role to play. I am not the church, but we are the church, and each one of us has a role to play in it. We need each other. The Apostle Paul uses the imagery of the body, and he says, wouldn't it be funny if we all were an eye? No, that would be disgusting. How weird would it be if all of us were just like, you know what, I'm going to be the pinky finger. Cute, but sometimes it feels like kind of unnecessary. And thus you break it, and you realize you can't grab, grip anything without it. Maybe I just want to be, no, no, no. Paul talks about the imagery of the body, how all of us together makes the body of Christ. All of us together, we need each other. Paul even says that some of us are like the ligaments and the tendons. Well, I don't want to be a ligament. How many of you in here ever tore your ACL? You need it after you break it, don't you? All of these things matter. All of us matter. We all need each other, to be united together in the name of Jesus. Because here's the cool thing. Moses didn't build the tabernacle by himself, but the nation and the community built it together. Moses received the plans, the artisans did the work, and the people brought the supplies. So what can we learn from this passage of Scripture for us today? Number one, take inventory of what you have, because what we need may already be in the house. Now, some of us, and I'm going to meddle for a minute, we have boxes left over from the last time we moved. Mm-hmm. You're not laughing because it's true. How many of you in here have boxes from the last time you moved? And Yeah, hands are going up all over the place. I'm just going to do an altar call right now. <laughs> Best response I've had all week long. And here's the funny thing is, is, and I'm not going to ask, but, I, okay, I am. How many of you moved more than a year ago? 
Okay. You moved more than a year ago, and you still have boxes left unpacked. Okay. But here's why we do it, and, and I know why we do it, especially we Southerners or we Midwesterners. Here's why we do it. Because we have this intrinsic fear that just as soon as we sell something, throw it away or give it away, then someday we'll be going through the house and we'll be looking for something. Hey, honey, have you seen my, well, didn't we throw that away? And then in that moment, all of life's disappointments heap upon us. And then we make the walk of shame. We go down to Walmart or Amazon, but we go down to Walmart and we find the one that we had and we look at the price like, oh man, this was 10 bucks when I bought it last time. Now it's $19.95. Or, or even worse, we had a good one and now they don't make it anymore. And so you try to go find one and you don't ever like it. And for the rest of your life, you compare this one that you bought to the one that you gave away. That's what we do. That's what we do. So that's why we don't like to get rid of anything. But the funny thing is, is that in the case of Israel and, and their case, they had been carrying with them the makings of the tabernacle since they had left Egypt. Catch this. When, the, when Israel left Egypt... The Egyptians paid them to leave, and they brought with them all kinds of jewelry and valuables. Scripture says, and in this way, they plundered the Egyptians. So catch this. God had a purpose and a plan for what they had been given in Egypt. And so when the Israelites left Egypt, they had no idea that they were carrying with them the seeds of something holy had no idea. They just thought, well, hey, I've been a slave, so I'm going to take what I've got. So I've got these jewelry, and I've got these brooches, and I've got this linen, and I've got this thread, and someday I want to make for me something really cool. What they didn't realize is that as they stewarded these things through the desert, as they carried them through the Red Sea, as they carried them through the wilderness, what they didn't realize was that God had a purpose and a plan for the stuff they've been carrying. They just didn't know it yet. For our case, it might be experiences, it might be educations, it might be moments in our past, and you're wondering, why in the world did I go through that? Why in the world did I learn this? Why in the world did I accumulate this? Why in the world have I, have I been carrying this for so long? Perhaps there's coming a day in the future where God says to you, hey, do you remember that experience? Do you remember that situation? Do you remember those late nights? Do you remember those tears? Well, let me tell you that what you didn't realize is that you were carrying something that would become the seed for something holy. Well, the problem is, it's that so often we are accumulating these experiences and these encounters and these opportunities, these talents, these giftings, but we do what is normal to people. Instead of saving them for God, we use them on other things. So just a few chapters before, when Israel took their earrings and their gold, and instead of using it for, to build the tabernacle, what did they build? A golden calf. Now do you see the connections? You see, although their intentions, like they had an idea, hey, we've got this stuff, let's build something to worship, they were worshiping wrong at the wrong time, the wrong gods. They, they were early. They were two chapters early. And so now God is saying, hey, you know what? Those necklaces, those earrings, those brooches, all these things that you've been carrying with you, you know, the ones that you tried to give away to the golden calf? Now I'm going to ask them for them. And the fun thing is, is that the people says, and they gave willingly. They knew what it was like to, to sacrifice at the wrong God. They knew what it was like to use their jewelry or their experiences or their talents or their giftings. They knew what it was like to use it on the wrong God. Now they were ready to use it on the right God. Some of you have been through some stuff. And God has given you talents. He's given you abilities. He's given you means. But you've been using it at the wrong place with the wrong God. 
And now God's saying, you are at a different place. You're in a different time. You're a different person than you used to be. So now instead of using those opportunities, instead of now using those things to worship the world, now it's time for you to use them for Jesus. Don't hide those gifts just because you used them incorrectly at wrong time, at one time or another. See, I find it interesting that everything needed to complete the tabernacle was already in the people's possession. And this one excites me as a pastor. I look around and see where we are at as a church. And I can't help but think, what is God up to? And here's why I'm thinking this. Because I know that God does not hoard. God is a giver of good gifts. And he is also calls us to practice stewardship. And a part of stewardship is using gifts in the right place at the right time. And I can't help but look around this congregation and think of all the gifts that are present in this body and wonder to myself, what is God up to? What is God getting ready to do? As he literally brings people from all parts of this country to move to Licking, Missouri and Edgar Springs and to Houston of all places, what is God up to? I can't help but think that God is not bringing this all into the storehouse to hoard it, but he's bringing it all together so that when he's ready, we might have something to offer to him. Amen? This is pretty evident in Luke chapter 12 as, Ju- as Jesus tells this story. He tells him a parable. He said a rich man's land was very productive. And so he thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? So I will do this, he said. I'll tear down, tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? That's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Now, I will say that we have, probably you've, never, you've heard this before. And people will say, well, the sin of the passage is getting rich. No, 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 that's not what the sin of the passage is. The sin of the passage is to not be generous and to be a good steward with the extra that God had given. That's the sin of the passage. By, by the world standards, we are all rich in here. Turn on your water faucet, you have water, you're rich. Make more than a dollar a day, you're rich. If you don't believe me, ask some of us who have traveled over the world and we've seen what, what third worlds look like. Majority world, they call it. So it's not, it's not the sin to be rich. The, the, the foolish man's thing is, is like, hey, I'm going to build these barns, I'm going to store it up, and I'm just going to take it easy. And I'm not going to do anything with what God has given me. That's the sin. I dare say that many Christians are guilty of this sin because God gives us talent, he gives us giftings, and we reach a place in life where now we can cruise. And we just want to cruise from there. But that's not what God's calling us to. Each stage of life has a different anointing and a different calling and a different purpose. So don't waste it. Be faithful and be a good steward with what God has given you. Because the gifts are in the house. What God is calling us to do, God has equipped us to do through his spirit. So let's do it. Got to move on. Number two. So not only are the gifts in the midst, but number two, God calls some to excel in giving, some in working, and some in both. I think it's helpful to recognize that not everyone in Israel was called to build or to craft the tabernacle. If we were living in the Old Testament times and perhaps they were calling for workers, there are several people in this room who would be very qualified to build and measure. Pastor Ben, great craftsman. Pastor Hoffman, great craftsman. Me, I'm the guy who hands the tools to the guy who uses the tools. If you don't believe me, Pastor Hoffman was trying to teach me how to read a tape measure during a building project. Boy, I don't know how successful it was. But we're not all called to do everything. God has equipped some of us to do specific things, and that's where you're supposed to be obedient. 
Some are called to lead, some are called to give, some are called to do. And so do what God has gifted you to do. So often we're jealous of someone else's gifts. And instead of operating in generosity, we operate in jealousy. But But don't don't be be jealous jealous of someone someone else's gifts. gifts. Develop Develop the the gifts that that God has given you. you. Don't Don't be jealous. Because as God God has equipped you to do one thing, he's equipped you to do another and you to do another. And when we all come together as the body of Christ, then we're we're able to build up what God is calling us to build. So my question for us is, what is God calling you to do in this season? What is God calling you to do in this season? Whether you're a teenager or you're a retired adult, whether you have kids at home or your kids are fixing to leave, thank Jesus, I'm sure. What is God calling you to do in this season? What is God calling you to do? And say, well, pastor, there just isn't much for me to do at church. I didn't say anything about the church. What about the kingdom? What is God calling you to do for the kingdom? Because the kingdom is far bigger than this church. The kingdom of God is far bigger than this this building and this property and this group of people. The kingdom is large. And we're called to advance the kingdom of God. So if you want to serve at bridge builders, serving with the seniors, do it unto the Lord and advance the kingdom. If where God has called you is in the public education system, then advance the kingdom right where you're at. If you're a stay-at-home mom, then you have one of the greatest callings the Lord has given you. Please mother your children. Because that's important. But what is God calling you to do in this season? Where has God placed you and what has God uniquely uh, empowered you to do? So often people will come to their pastor to ask, but that's not my question to answer. It's yours. What has God called you to do? Because God calls some of us to excel in giving, some in working, some in both. But we all have a part to play. Third, and I like this one. Don't forget that small but consistent giving adds up over time. Verse 22 said, Both men and women came, and all who had willing hearts brought brooches, earrings, rings, necklaces, and all kinds of gold jewelry. Everyone who presented a presentation offering of gold to the Lord. Now, It's possible that in the Exodus context that there were some really big givers. In fact, some of the leaders, they gave gave the the gems and the jewels for it, right? It's possible that some were really big givers, but if so, they're anonymous. If so, they are overshadowed by ordinary people who are giving ordinary gifts. Now, I don't really know what a brooch is, I'm going to be honest, or how big a brooch is. But I've bought my wife plenty of earrings over the years rings and necklaces, and I know that they're relatively small. And so the power in what they were giving wasn't in their size, but it was in the amount and it was in the consistency of what they were giving. My dear brother or sister, never discount the value of small offerings over time. Maybe you don't make the most money in the room. Maybe you're not the most talented Maybe what you have seems small and inconsequential compared to some. But small and seemingly inconsequential gifts add up over time. And when we add our gifts to God's blessings, he can do whatever he wants to. When we give our gifts back to God and we say, God, would you bless these? Guess what? He multiplies them in a way that we can't do. I don't know about you, but I have found in my lifetime that when I tithe, it's just 10%, but when I tithe, that God does more with the 90 than I ever did with the 100. And I'm thankful that I started tithing when I was not making any money. I remember when I worked for Sonic, the wife and I got married. We didn't know any better at 19 to get married. We thought making $300 every two weeks was enough money. It wasn't. Thankfully, we lived on love and McDonald's. <laughs> Thankfully, I've got to say, <laughs> we lived on love and McDonald's. It's very true. But we learned to tithe then. 
We learned to tithe with a $30 tithe. And now, thanks be to Jesus, I don't make $300 every two weeks anymore. But I learned that when I give it to the Lord, even if it's small, that God has a way of blessing it. Some of you are holding back your gifts from God because you think they're too small. And you're waiting for some future day to say, well, when I develop these gifts, when they become more, when they become significant, that's when I'll serve God. But God's sitting back and saying, no, 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 no. You'll never serve with your gifts if you have a lot of them unless you're faithful with the small things. God will never entrust you with more until you're faithful with little. And it's possible that even though that you're looking at your talents or your giftings or your offering and you think, man, these are small, it's very well possible that that small thing is exactly what God has needed. To use that imagination that Pastor Ben was talking about a little bit earlier, maybe think about those who were carrying with them the acacia wood. It ended up being what they, what they had made a lot of the furniture out of and then they would overcase it with gold. Can you imagine being the person who has this Beautiful piece of acacia wood where the grain is just perfect. There's no holes, there's no knots. It's just a beautiful piece of lumber. And you've been carrying this through the, through the wilderness. You've been carrying it through the Red Sea. You've been carrying this with you. And, you. and you're looking around and people are bringing wagon loads and truck loads of wood and all you have is this one piece. But perhaps, it's not in scripture, but perhaps using our imagination, what if that person came to the artisan and said, it's not much, but this is what I have. And wouldn't it be amazing if that artisan looked at that and said, I know exactly where this piece belongs. We've been waiting to put this piece together. We've been waiting to find the right piece of lumber with the right grain going in the right direction so that it might fit and that it might be perfect unto the Lord. And that piece is exactly what I needed. Perhaps... When people were leaving Egypt, one of the women received less jewelry than others. And as they noticed, some people were bringing in bulk. The woman looked and saw see that she only had one brooch. But in that brooch was one perfect stone. And as she took it to the artisan required to find the stones that would go in the priest's ephod, perhaps that was the exact one they had been looking for. I say all that to say this. When you discount what God has given you, Or when you compare what God has given you, you miss out on the beauty of the offering. YouTube and Facebook, they're they're powerful tools, but one of the worst things they do is is they lead us to comparison, which leads us to to jealousy, and jealousy stops us. Jealousy is a game stopper because we end up not using our gifts at all. Church, I just want to encourage you to use the gifts and to develop the gifts that God has given you. For they are God-given gifts. And I'm reminded of the words of my mother. If you don't use your gifts, then you'll lose them. Use what God has given you. And lastly, it's our hearts that make the difference. Our hearts make the difference. Now I want to say something that I think is pretty profound. When you are a slave, you aren't used to being able to give, but you're used to being taken from. Israel had been, for 430 years, a nation of slaves. So now God was teaching them how not to be slaves anymore. Now he was teaching them how to be priests. See, people take from slaves, but priests give. Slaves, you take from a slave. But when you become a priest, you give. God had to change the hearts of Israel from the hearts of slaves to the hearts of priests. I, I grew up, and I didn't really realize it, but I grew up, and, and even to this day, I struggle with a poverty mindset. Poverty mindset says, I better hold on to what I have now because there may not be any more. It's a scarcity mindset. And it shows up for me, it shows up in really weird ways. Like when Julie and I were drinking milk, we don't buy milk. And primary reason because we don't buy milk is that I, I, I won't finish the gallon. Why? I can, afford, I can afford milk. 
But early on growing up, my, my parents worked hard. I was raised in a good family, but we were poor. We'd have one or two gallons of milk per month for three kids. And I, it was always in the back of my mind is, well, if I drink all this, I can't go get more. Boxes of cereal. I had to stop buying these boxes of cereal because I wouldn't finish a box if I didn't have another one to replace it. Weird stuff. I find at times that whenever I'm looking at things, if I see a bargain on something or something on sale, I have to fight the temptation to buy it. Not because I need it or necessarily because I want it, but because the scarcity mindset, the poverty mindset says, if I don't buy it now, I may not be able to get it later. Like anybody else kind of like, it's weird. I know this is weird. But I bring that mentality into adulthood with me. Not dad's fault, not mom's fault. I'm not blaming anybody. It's just something that I personally face and fight. And so when I read a passage like this from Exodus, I I can kind of grasp the change from being a slave and being a hoarder to being a giver. And so some of the things the Lord has to work in my heart is, is that I need to be more free to give and to give generously. Some of us, because of maybe our past, because of our situations and our circumstances, We're struggling to give what we have to the Lord, not because we don't have enough, but because deep down inside there's this nagging voice that says, if you give it away, you'll never get it back. If you give it away, there may not be enough left at the end of the day. If you give it away, then what if? And so instead of investing our gifts in the kingdom, we hoard them. God had to move Israel from a slave mindset to a priest mindset. How does this show up with us at times? Be very specific. I caution you and I, because I pay tithes too. Yes, my paycheck comes from the church. I still tithe on it. Okay? Don't view your tithes and your offerings as a tax. It's not a tax. It's not a tax required for us to enter heaven. You're not paying your membership dues each week when you give of your paycheck. Tithes and offerings are not the price of membership, like getting a Sam's Club or a Costco membership. Giving is worship, not a tax. Giving is worship. See, when I pay my quarterly estimates on taxes, the federal government doesn't care if I like it or not. They just want to make sure that that check is good and that it's on time. And so I will confess that most of the time, four times a year, when I write my quarterly estimates, I'm not happy about it. They don't care. But when I give of myself for my offerings to the Lord, I've got to check the heart. I've got to give with a willing and generous heart because if I don't, I miss out on the blessings that God has provided for us. So we see that Israel, as they were building up the tabernacle, they gave with a generous and willing heart to the point that there was so much material available that the artisans had, had to say, stop, stop giving, giving offerings. offerings. We, we have, have too, too much, much to give. We, we have too much. much. We, we just have too much to stop. stop. That's, That's how, how generous, generous the people were. And I believe, truly, That if you give what God has put upon your heart, whether that's time or talent or treasures, not just money, there will be enough for the work to be done, and you get to keep the rest. So this morning, what is God asking you to give? And where is he asking you to give it to? Please please do not limit giving to just money. Because, quite honestly, sometimes money is the easiest thing for us to give. In this day and time, our time is far more valuable than money. But what has God given you to hold on to? And what is he perhaps asking you to give now? Are you willing to give of your life, to give of yourselves, to give of your experiences, your opportunities? Are you willing to give it to the Lord? 
and have invested back in the kingdom. Next week we're talking about Pentecost Sunday and we are believing for revival to happen. But if you hold yourself back, revival will not happen. It's not going to happen. If you hold back the giftings that God has given you, the plans that God has for this church may not go forward. Because he's called us all together to come together to be the body of Christ to advance the kingdom. So what is God asking you to give and where is he asking you to give it to? Would you stand this morning?